Okay, so thanks, uh, and um, I'm sorry for giving the last talk, but you know. uh, I'm, I, I'll talk about three different uh, challenges that arise in, in uh, social media advertising, privacy, fairness, and uh, transparency. So uh, I, I think after the end of this day, it's, it's not very difficult to convince you that we are being surrounded by uh, data-driven decision-making systems. So I list some of them here, uh, criminal risk assessment tools, credit score, targeted advertising. Basically, the idea behind those systems is that they, they use some of our personal data. Uh, they make some sort of inference and uh, prediction, and uh, then they make some decisions that, that uh, relate to us, that impact us in, uh, in some way. And because of this, uh, they are somehow scary uh, for multiple reasons. So, so I, I think, uh, I mean, I'm, I might be giving you s uh, some extra reasons for you to be scared about them, but at least there are a few ones. One is that we know that they have a lot of data about us, and this is a bit scary because we're not completely sure, uh, uh, you know, what, what can happen. Uh, one is that they make decisions that impact us, and we don't really know how. And the last is uh, that we mainly don't understand them well, and so we, we are scared uh, because of that. And uh, today I want to discuss only about one of these systems, uh, which is uh, targeted advertising. So uh, more specifically, I'm going to focus on Facebook. So this is not the system that looks the most scary of all. Uh, it's, it's an ad that you receive when you browse through Facebook. Um, and um, the, the question that I want to start thinking of is, uh, why am I being shown this particular ad and not another one? Uh, what is the data that Facebook has inferred about me that led to the decision of showing me this ad. Uh, am I being discriminated against? And eventually, is there any risk for my privacy since I know that this decision is based on a lot of data which is uh, held about myself? So I'm going to discuss about only this system of targeted advertising with Facebook. Uh, this is an important <coughs> system, first of all, because it is the, for it's the main advertising platform for many people. Um, discrimination is a real issue in Facebook because Facebook is uh, one of the main uh, channel for people to receive job ads. Some people receive job ads only through Facebook. Some people receive news only through Facebook. So if there is some sort of discrimination or manipulation uh, going on there, it's, it's going to be uh, a real important issue. So before I actually uh, talked about uh, these the three challenges, I want to give you a, a two minutes uh, background on how this targeted advertising works. The first thing that you don't know yet, but um, you're going to know in one minute, is that all of you, if you have a Facebook account, is an advertiser. So it's extremely easy to create an ad. You click on this create an ad uh, button. You don't need any kind of registration besides uh, only having a Facebook account. Uh, and, and this simplicity is going to be important uh, in a minute. Now, how can you target your ad? Well, uh, there are two methods. The, the main one is that uh, Facebook has a very large list of attributes that they maintain about each user. And you can just, on an interface, interface like this, select a Boolean formula of the attributes of users that you want to target. So one example is this. Uh, you want your audience to be married people who are new mover and, uh, and live in uh, Grenoble. So that's just one example. Facebook actually has inferred themselves uh, 614 attributes about every single user. But also, in addition to those, uh, in different countries, they ha I mean, they're working with uh, companies which are called data brokers. So I list uh, some, of, some of them here, Axiom, Epsilon, and so on. And these data brokers collect data about users offline. So typically in the US using uh, loyalty cards of uh, different shops, uh, credit card information, and things like this. And uh, this data is being matched to, to, to Facebook accounts. So as an advertiser, you can uh, use data inferred by Axiom to target a user on Facebook. So in total, depending on your country, uh, in, in the US it's over the, uh, 1,100. Uh, in, in some other country, it's, it's uh, closer to 600. OK, so what does this uh, attribute look like? Well, uh, some of them are, are, are uh, relatively uh, expected. 
uh, purchasing behavior, residential profile, travel, uh, you know, financial, football, uh, job roles, things like this. Some of them might uh, look slightly more sensitive. You can target people interested in homosexuality. You can target people interested in fascism or in anti-fascism. And finally, you can target relatively finely based on the income of, of the people that uh, you want to reach. Okay, so uh, the second possible way of uh, uh, ta um, targeting people in Facebook is uh, a bit less well known. It's called PII based targeting, and this basically consists in you, you can upload a list of PII's. So, for instance, you upload a list of 100 emails. And you can ask Facebook, please advertise to your users that correspond to these 100 email addresses. PII means personally identifiable information. So that can be, an, is this something that uniquely identify a users? Uh, uniquely identifies a user, sorry. So that can be email, uh, that can be a phone number, that can be a mobile advertiser ID. Uh, that can be a combination of name and address or name and date of birth, uh, things like this. Okay? So this is uh, how you can target on Facebook. Now, uh, this advertisement platform, this Facebook advertisement platform, is uh, the main way in which Facebook is actually making money. And you have to pay money for ads that are being shown, yes. You, you don't have to pay to play with the platform, but uh, you, you pay per impression of the ad. So if, if the ad is eventually being shown to users, then, then you, you have to pay, yes. Um, okay, so now, uh, in itself, uh, it's, it's not really a problem that Facebook would allow advertisers to select their audience. Uh, but what I want to uh, discuss here is that uh, there are a few major challenges with this um, advertisement platform and with the way they, they operate. So the first one that I want to discuss is privacy. And the question is, is there any privacy risk with this uh, social media advertisement uh, platform? Um, and before I tell you exactly what is the privacy risk that, that, that uh, we have discovered, uh, just one last piece of information is that when you create an audience through this target uh, advertisement platform, Facebook also gives you an estimate of the size of the audience. So I mean, if you, if, if you uh, say I want uh, new movers who live in Grenoble and uh, are married, then they'll tell you, okay, there, is, there are like uh, 26 of them. So not, not actually, I mean, 26 is not really an eligible number. They won't say 26. I'll explain uh, just a bit after what is the possible number that they might answer. But this is basically the idea is that they tell you how many people satisfy the criteria that, that you have defined. They also allow you to, sorry, okay, uh, allow you to compute the intersection of two audiences, okay, and uh, give you an, a, a, an estimate of the size of this intersection. And finally, they allow you to combine by uh, inclusion, uh, union, or exclusion, and again, uh, give you a, 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 an estimate of uh, the size of the audience. So why is this a problem? Well, what we have discovered is that from this size estimate, if you are a malicious advertiser, there are a number of uh, relatively bad things that you might uh, be able to do. So. The first one is from one PII of a user, for instance, from an email, you can first learn whether this individual has an, an account at Facebook or not. That's a first uh, privacy violation. Much more serious is that you can also find other PII's. So for instance, if you know the email of somebody, by manipulating this advertisement system, you can figure out the phone number of, of this uh, same individual. You can also figure out whether this person has visited a website that you control. This works by what's called a, a Facebook pixel. Facebook, if you control a website, Facebook can give you a small piece of uh, JavaScript code that you put in the website. And then if somebody visits the website, if they are logged on to Facebook when they visit the website, then, then uh, they, they, belo they uh, become part of the audience, this pixel audience, and you can later say, I want to target people who have visited my website. And finally, uh, maybe the most serious of all is that you can actually de-anonymize website visitor 
en masse, which means that basically you can figure out all phone numbers of all visitors of a given website. So, how does this work? Where well, it's, uh, well, first, be before I tell you, I mean, I'm not sure <laughs> if I need to tell you all this, but in case you're not convinced that uh, figuring out the phone number of somebody uh, might be a very serious uh, issue, so this is a, a headline that said, Facebook turns down Pakistan request to link accounts to mobile phone numbers. So Pakistan government asked Facebook, please link every, uh, every account to a phone number, and Facebook said, no, 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 no. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is violating individual liberty. And then a few months later, Pakistan uh, government uh, mandated that every uh, mobile phone owner has their uh, fingerprint uh, on, on, on record. Uh, and uh, finally, this last uh, one is, uh, is uh, reporting on um, what's called a social engineering attack, where if you know the phone number of somebody and a few other um, uh, data on that person, uh, you, ki you can call the phone company and uh, trick the person into rerouting uh, whatever comes to this phone number to another phone number, and that uh, has been uh, breaking the two-factor authentication, uh, which is uh, a big part of uh, security in, in many uh, systems. Okay, so now how does it work? Well, it's actually incredibly easy. If you think about it, assume that first the audience size estimates are exact. What Facebook is doing, which is uh, the key to all of these uh, privacy violations, is that they deduplicate records that belong to the same individual, even if they appear with two different PIIs. What that means is that if you ask for the size of an audience that has this email address, XYZ, and this phone number, 01234, if they belong to two different individuals, Facebook will say two. If they belong to the same individual, Facebook will answer one, and then you will know that uh, the phone number corresponding to this person is 01234. Now, if you want to figure out the phone number of an email address uh, without knowing anything about it, then you will have to, f to, to ask uh, for every possible phone number. That might be a little bit difficult to do 100 million queries to Facebook. But it's actually, there is a, 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 an alternative attack which is much more efficient. Still assuming that the audience size estimate are exact, if you want to figure out the first digit of the phone number, what you can do is that you create lists that I call here L1J, for J equals zero through nine. And so each of these lists, for instance, for J equals zero, the list contains all phone numbers that starts with zero. For J equals one, all phone numbers that starts with a one. If there are eight digits, then the lists have size 10 to the power seven, which is 10 million entries. And it turns out it's absolutely not a problem to upload to Facebook a, a, a custom list of uh, 10 million entries. Now, if you ask for the size of the intersection between this list that only contains this email address and L1J, if Facebook answers one, then you know the first digit is J. If they answer zero, then you know it's not J, okay? If you want to figure out the other uh, digits, you repeat the same thing, where you upload lists with the second digit being zero, second digit being one, and so on and so forth. You figure out the second digit, at, and, and you can do that uh, until you find the uh, complete phone number. Now, are the estimates uh, exact? Of course, no, they're not. But it turns out uh, they are not very far from being exact. They are actually just deterministically rounded. So what we did, we reverse engineered the system. Turns out this is very simple. For audience size estimate, if there was, uh, so they were giving no estimate for lists of size less than 20. For lists of size between 20 and 1,000, they were rounding to the closest 10. Between 1,000 and 10,000, rounding to the closest 100, and so on and so forth. For intersection, it's a little bit more restrictive. They give that only for lists of size over 1,000 and round to 5% of the smallest list. Okay, but still deterministically. And so uh, what we can do in practice is that we can do the same thing using threshold lists. So we construct lists such that for, for a given list, you are rounding down. If you, if you add just one element to the list, this uh, is, is, uh, starts being uh, rounding up. Okay? And so if you do, we're using this principle, we can uh, do the attack uh, relatively 
easily. So how easily? Well, we tried in France and in Boston. In France, um, you need to upload 82 lists. So 82 is because the first digit is only six or seven. You, it's an, and so these are lists of 20 million records. And that takes one week, but you need only to do it once. Okay, in the US, uh, knowing the area code, you only need 70 lists of uh, one million, uh, one million uh, of size one million, and that takes only one day. Now, finding this threshold audience that I was talking about before takes under six hours. That's also something that you only need to do once, and then it takes one hour per victim to figure out uh, the, the phone number uh, associated to a given email address. And we have similar numbers uh, for, for the other attacks, like de-anonymizing de visitor of a website that, that uh, I was talking about uh, earlier. So, uh, of course, uh, we reported that uh, to Facebook. Uh, they solved the problem. Perhaps I, I, I should have uh, put that in court. On, on December 22, so we had proposed a solution which is essentially based on not deduplicating the records because this is the essence of the problem, right? And uh, what they did on December 22 is, was even more conservative. They said, if there are two different types of PII, we, we will not even give an estimate. We are not going to give uh, so, some, some uh, other types of estimate. We'll just give uh, nothing at all. So that's uh, more conservative. Now, um, uh, let, let, let's see um, if, if they can sustain not giving estimate, because giving estimate is uh, basically something that they want to do for, for in the interest of the advertisers. This is one of the elements that, that helps them uh, differentiate from other advertising platforms. Uh, but even still, many challenges remain. So this is only one leakage. Uh, Advertising platforms are increasingly rich and complex. Uh, this happened because they introduced what's, what was called the, this uh, PII-based targeting. And uh, after a while, we realized that uh, there is a privacy leakage there, which is quite important. They are uh, introducing new features uh, every month. And so uh, are there other privacy leakage? We don't know. What about the other platform? And more generally, I think, uh, so, as these systems that sh have a lot of data about users share it with advertiser in some way, it's being extremely difficult to analyze the privacy leakage in a systematic way. So I think that's, that's a very important uh, open challenge for the, for the privacy of, uh, of uh, these uh, advertising systems. So uh, this is the answer for this first challenge. As a privacy risk, yes, uh, and it's actually not really so straightforward to guarantee uh, for any kind of systems that there would be no leakage uh, at all. Now, what about fairness? So, uh, can we at least uh, make sure that it's not possible to uh, do discriminatory advertising? So, I th I mean, again, uh, I think uh, you might have seen these uh, headlines. So, this was uh, ProPublica in October 2016 that uh, showed that Facebook lets advertisers exclude users by race for housing ads, and this comes in violations of, of the Fair Housing Act in the, in the US. And the response of Facebook was, uh, we are going to ban the ethnic affinity. So first, uh, well, they, they had three different levels of response. They first said, well, ethnic affinity uh, is not ethnicity, it's just ethnic affinity. That was the first response. The second response was, because there's a confusion, let's just uh, rename it multicultural affinity, as if it was going to change anything. And this last thing was, uh, they banned the ethnic affinity targeting uh, for housing. Meaning that if you are, are uh, placing an ad for uh, housing, you are not allowed to use this attribute in your targeting formula. Question is, is this working? So. Recently also, there was this uh, article in the New York Times saying Facebook job ads raise concern about age discrimination that might come in, in violation of the Age Discrimination in Employment Act, again, in, in the US. And uh, the question is, uh, would, 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 um, sorry, would uh, banning the age feature uh, be sufficient to guarantee uh, that, that there is no possible discrimination? And the answer is uh, no. It's 
without using a sensitive attribute, it's very easy to create very discriminatory audiences by at least three different ways. The first that uh, is, is, is relatively classical, it's called uh, proxy features. So in fact, if you want to target African American without using the multicultural affinity feature, it's easy, you can just target people interested in gospel. It turns out that most of them are actually African American. And it's even worse because uh, uh, Facebook allows also some free form attributes. So is there are, is these are the Facebook pages that you might like. And for instance, you can, if you want, target uh, people who, who like the page of this. Uh, this is a magazine called blacknews.com. And of course, uh, many of them are actually African American. So that's one way, uh, using proxy features that are correlated to the sensitive features that, that you wanted to ban. The second is, is this, again, custom list or this PII-based targeting. What's happening here is that you can find external data sources where you can have lists of PIIs with the race associated to those people, for instance. In the uh, US, for instance, in North Carolina the, the, in, and in many other states, the uh, voter records are public, meaning that you can download the list of all the voters in the state, and this list contains information about the race of the individuals. So if you take this list, um, you just take the names and, uh, and uh, addresses of the people, you erase uh, the, the, the race from this, you upload that as a custom list with the uh, PII, and uh, you have a, a very discriminatory audience without having ever used the multicultural affinity attributes. And if this list is not big enough, you can also use what's called the lookalike audience feature, where Facebook tells you, I'm going to expand your audience to people who are similar. And of course, sure enough, uh, this uh, expansion of the audience is perpetuating the bias very well, so that you can expand while keeping the, the uh, discriminatory uh, feature of, the, of this. Uh, audience. So um, banning a feature is not enough to uh, guarantee non-discriminatory advertising. What we advocate is that we need, it, it's not possible to uh, measure discrimination by the process. It's necessary that you only look at the outcome, meaning the targeted audience is that you compare that to a notion of a relevant audience, which would be the set of people who are potentially interested in the ad, and you need to have the same statistical characteristic between the two. Of course, that poses a number of challenges. First of all, this uh, relevant audience is difficult to measure. You don't have it, so how to infer the relevant audience? And then uh, how to mitigate uh, once, you have, uh, uh, once you have detected a possibly discriminatory audience? So this was uh, the second challenge. Can we detect and mitigate discriminatory advertising? The answer is that uh, it is very unclear and we need uh, new uh, methods for, for doing that. Now, can we at least know when we receive an ad, why we have received this ad? And potentially that, that might help us uh, uh, know if we are subject to uh, discriminatory uh, targeting. Or not. So, this is actually a relatively complex question, so I'm going to focus here on only a sub-question, which is if I receive this ad, uh, why am I being shown this particular? Sorry? No. <laughs> this is not my Facebook account, and I, I will not disclose whose it is for uh, <laughs> obvious reasons. Um, uh, there is a t tiny picture here, but I'm hoping you cannot really see. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the only real uh, definitive answer I can give you about why you are seeing this ad is that it's actually really complicated. So first, targeted advertising is a complex system. Facebook has inferred some attributes, then the advertiser has used this attribute to select an audience, and even after that, Facebook has matched the ad, so there's been a, an auction process involving competing advertiser at the same time, and the bid that they had, and also uh, potentially click prediction by, by Facebook uh, based on uh, who knows uh, what, what uh, method and data. And the second reason why it's complicated is that what is a good explanation is extremely unclear. So 
it really depends on what we want from an explanation. So here I list a few things that we might want. We might want it to promote trust. We might want it to just satisfy curiosity of users. We might want it to uh, deter malicious behavior or to verify compliance of the system. And for all of these purposes, we might need different uh, types of explanations. So uh, what we did is that Facebook is actually providing some explanation in the following form. So this is an ad. And uh, if you click here on this thing called, why am I saying this? You will receive an explanation that Facebook gives you, uh, which is of the following form. The first, uh, first part here is one of the reason you're saying this is because we think you may be an expat from India. So this, this was an, an ad received by an, an Indian colleague. And this, there is a second part that says there may be other reasons, such as maybe they want to reach people age 21 and older who live in Germany. Okay? This is a form of what Facebook gives you as an explanation. Now, it's good to give explanation, but, but I mean, are, are this explanation good? Well, as I said before, it's difficult to define what good means. So what we did is that we defined a number of properties that answer to natural questions, and we tried to audit Facebook explanation against these different properties. So I'm going to talk only about the first two. The first one is, do they show all the attributes? Are the explanation complete? And the second is, where the attributes showed actually used by the advertiser, which I, I'll call uh, correctness of the explanation. And I'll show you uh, some of the results we got with this uh, uh, following measurement. So we built a Chrome extension that collects ads and explanations from the Facebook timeline. We asked 35 users to install it. Uh, they, inst they kept it for uh, five months. I mean, they still have it, but we, the data I'm, I'm going to talk about is uh, during five months. Uh, we had uh, 26K unique ads and explanation. And what we did uh, is that we did some controlled experiments. That means that we behave as an advertiser. We define some parameters of the campaign. Then we make sure that we target the people, these 35 people who have installed our, our uh, extension. We see what Facebook gives as an explanation. We compare that to the parameter we have imposed in the campaign, and that gives us uh, the, the ground truth. We had uh, 96 uh, successful such campaigns, that, and this is the result of these 96 campaigns that I'm going to discuss further. So the first question is, are Facebook explanation complete? And uh, in, in, in this way, I mean, there are several ways in which Facebook explanations are not complete, which I'm not going to discuss here. I'm going to discuss only one way in which uh, the explanations are not complete. This is when we target with Facebook attributes. Remember, these are these 614 attributes which are inferred by Facebook. They are not data brokers or PII. Uh, they are actual uh, curated Facebook attributes. What happens here is that uh, whatever the campaign is, you're going to receive an explanation of the phone I showed before. One reason you are seeing this is that this advertiser uh, wants to reach people interested in this. So they will only give you one possible attribute. We have tried many different campaigns with many more than just one attribute. They always give only one attribute. So clearly, this is not complete. But maybe they choose this attribute very well, such that this is giving you uh, super useful information. Well, so uh, here is how we think that they are, they are picking the attribute. So we run a number of controlled ads uh, uh, to reverse engineer the way they select this one attribute that they are showing. And uh, what seems to happen is that Facebook prioritize attributes in two ways. First, their type. So if there is a demographic attribute in the campaign, they'll show you. If there is no demographic attribute, they'll show you the interest attribute. If there is no interest attribute, they'll show you the PII. If there's no PII, they'll show you the behavioral attributes. So we haven't actually made any uh, uh, real serious analysis about the sensitivity of the different attributes. We still need to do that. But it sort of seems like an unnatural kind of uh, prioritization in the sense that usually behavioral attributes are more sensitive than interests, which are themselves uh, more sensitive than, than uh, demographic uh, attributes. Second, if you have in the campaign two interest attributes, which one are they going to show? 
Well, it turns out they show the most prevalent. The most prevalent means the one uh, that matches the highest number of users. So if you run an, uh, a campaign where you are targeting people who are uh, uh, interested in social networks, which is basically 95% uh, of, of uh, Facebook users, and uh, who are interested in fascism, what is going to appear for the user is that they receive this ad because the advertiser is uh, trying to reach people who are interested in social networks. So again, it's, it's not really clear whether this is the, the, the right uh, prioritization for, for users. So our Facebook explanation at least correct. Uh, here again, uh, I mean, the, the answer is, is uh, not really. And so what happens here is that if you run an ad campaign where you do not specify any location, what Facebook will show is that there may be other reason, blah, 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 such that they are trying to reach people who live in Germany. So they are basically making up a location. They are actually making, they are not making up a random location, they are just adding the location where the user is currently sitting. But it is not true to say that the advertiser has been trying to reach people in Germany because here in this particular campaign, the advertiser has not specified any location. So we call this misleading explanation. Why do we call it misleading and not incorrect? Because, you know, it starts with this, there may be other reasons. So there is uh, some sort of deniability or something like this. Um, and so, I mean, to, to conclude on, on, on this uh, transparency part, I think uh, the point that I want you to take away is that just mandating explanation is not enough in the sense, I mean, you know that the uh, EU regulation uh, gives the right to explanation. The uh, French uh, law, uh, Loi pour une République numérique, also mandates that, that uh, digital platform should be transparent. Uh, it's not enough to give any explanation. Badly designed explanation can actually do more harm than good. Incomplete explanation can allow malicious advertiser to conceal sensitive attributes, as I explained uh, uh, before, and misleading explanation uh, induce a false sense of trust. But the point is that it's actually not so straightforward to design a good explanation. And uh, so this is uh, one of the uh, one of the open uh, open challenge for this uh, transparency. If you are going to pick only a small number of attributes to show to the users because you think too many is going to overwhelm them, how do you pick a, f a, a, a small number K of features? How do you determine the in importance of a given feature? Should this relate to sensitivity, to prevalence, to influence? How do you de define influence of a feature on the result on the an algorithm? It's very unclear. What properties do we need to protect the gun, uh, malicious advertisers so that they're not able to conceal uh, sensitive or discriminatory uh, advertising? And finally, these things that I list here is that we have really only scratched the surface of the problem here because we have tried only to explain the way the advertiser is selecting the audience. But after that, as I said, there are uh, learning algorithms and auction mechanisms that take place that also uh, have uh, their saying in what is the ad that is shown to a given user and how to explain that is, is uh, extremely uh, unclear at the moment. So can I at least know what uh, data about me is used? Uh, it's uh, rather no, we need new methods to, to construct uh, explanations. And uh, to conclude in uh, 30 seconds, of course, some of the challenges that I have been presenting before, we are trying to tackle. And so uh, one thing that we are doing right now, which is one step towards more transparency, we have built this uh, tool, which is called Ad Analyst, which is helping you make sense of the ads you receive on Facebook. And it increases the transparency that Facebook is providing in two ways. One is that it provides um, um, time visualization where you can see what happened in the past when Facebook learned something, when Facebook unlearned something. You can also uh, discover, and it's quite funny that they do learn and unlearn many things uh, very, very often. And the second way in which it helps enhancing the transparency is what we call the collaborative transparency, is that it is uh, showing you some information not only about 
why you received a particular ad, but also who are the other users who received similar ads so that it, it helps you uh, make sense of uh, the, the targeting strategy of the advertisers that uh, you're facing. So uh, if you have a Facebook account, please go ahead, uh, download the tool. If you don't, please uh, go to your friends who have and <laughs> ask them to download the tool. Thank you.